All right, if you'd like to read uh, Psalm 93 with me, we'll use this as our prayer. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their, their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord, is, the Lord on high is mighty. Your, degree, your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. What number is it, Pastor? 44. 44? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
we'd like to turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, and we'll read verses 33 through 38. So as Pilate entered his headquarters again, and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over, over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Let us join together in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to have this place to come together to remind us that you love every single one of us. That you love us so much that you would not leave us where we were, but you came yourself to, to pull us up and to show us the way and Lord, as we consider your scripture and as we draw near to your spirit and center on, on who you are and who we are in you, we ask that the same spirit will inspire us so that your kingdom can come here on earth as it is in heaven. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The past few weeks we have, we have focused on the priesthood of Jesus. This week we move back from, from the letters written to encourage those early believers that followed Christ. And again, look at that period of time during Jesus' ministry. I often stop and, and consider the time frame surrounding Jesus' life. And as we approach the, the, the season we traditionally call Christmas, we are reminded of that story of Jesus' birth. In America, we sometimes get that backwards. We start singing Christmas songs basically from Thanksgiving until December 25th. And that's been pushed over to November 1st to December 25th. And then we abruptly stop. December 26th, if, if you hear another Christmas song, you're probably going to start a riot. But according to the church calendar... Christmas begins on December 25th, and it continues for 12 more days. The season prior, what, what retailers call the Christmas season, is what the church calls Advent. And there's a difference. Advent is that, that anticipation, that wanting, that desire to know what God has in store for us. Yet we don't really know for certain what it is. Next Sunday, we'll enter into that Advent season. And I guess I want to start it early, mainly because I'm that type of person that, that loves the major holidays. I could sing Christmas carols year-round. And I, I remember a few times when co-workers of mine would come into the office I was working in in the middle of the summer, and I'd be jamming to the Carol of the Bells. And they thought I was weird. And it's okay, because I'm at one with my own weirdness. It, you don't have to tell me anymore. And I can sit and gaze at a Christmas tree and with all the shining lights on it, and I could be singing when I survey the wondrous cross in my mind. For me, the entire story is important. Without the birth, there would not be Easter. And without Easter, there would be no need for the birth. We need the entire life of Jesus. 
from birth through his ministry, his suffering, his burial, and his resurrection. Now here's the kicker. Without the entire story of human history, from creation to the end of the ages, there would be no need for the story of Jesus. We are part of that story. Everything that we do today, every decision that we make, every conversation we have, Every smile we give, an argument that we participate in, is part of that story. We are that important. We are, and you are that important. One person's life can change the course of history, even if we never know that person's name. In the scientific and mathematical spheres of life, there's something called the chaos theory. Contrary to what that name implies, this theory speaks about how interconnected things are in our world. And within this theory, there's, there's an idea called the butterfly effect. And you've probably heard about that through the movies and that sort of thing, but it's, it's a really interesting theory. This is something that Ian Lawrence, a mathematician and meteorologist, formulated while he was studying weather patterns. He, he ran various models, computer models, trying to gain a better understanding of weather, particularly tornadoes, because tornadoes are, are one of the most unpredictable forces within weather. And this is probably why I know about it, because I'm from Kansas, rural Kansas, and we have tornadoes. Within this model, he would enter various measurements that they had recorded from previous storms into his computer. And he would begin to run the simulation that he, that he formulated. And as the testing went on, they were, they were getting the expected results. And then there was a day that he decided to take a little bit of a shortcut. Instead of typing out the full measurement that they, they, they measured, he rounded it up, left off a couple of the decimal places, and then he ran the test. And he got up and he, he walked down the hall and he got a cup of coffee and he came back. And in the amount of time that he went to get coffee, the computer simulated the weather of two months and the results were staggering and he said this in his book instead of a sudden break I found that the new values at first repeated the old ones but soon afterward differed by one and then several units in the last decimal place and then began to differ in the next to the last place and then in the last and then in the place before that. In fact, the differences were more or less steady, steadily double in size every four days or so, until all resemblance of the original output disappeared. Somewhere in the second month, this, this was enough to tell me what had happened. The number that I had typed in the numbers that I had typed in were not the exact original numbers, but were rounded off values that had appeared in the original printout. The initial round off errors were the culprits. They were steadily amplifying until they dominated the solution. We might not think much of this. If we've taken basic arithmetic, we know that if you change the numbers, the resulting solution of the math will change. But Lawrence was studying weather. That little change represented a seemingly insignificant change in atmospheric conditions. But that seemingly in insignificant change affected the weather of the future. Later, Lauren spoke about this uh, conversation that he had with other meteorologists, saying, If the theory is correct, then the flapping of one seagull's wings would be enough to alter the course of weather forever. That's a very interesting statement. 
The flapping of one bird's wings could change everything around us. Now that is about the total knowledge that I have of the chaos theory and the butterfly effect. It's a totally exhausted. You can't ask me any more questions because I've told you all I know. Every aspect of our, our lives is inter interconnected is what this theory is telling us. It's interconnected with the lives of those around us. When we make a decision, even a small insignificant decision, it can become either a blessing or a hardship for someone somewhere else. We may never see the effect that we have because the end result might be felt by someone on the other side of the world or, or may not even be fully sensed until two or three generations later. But what we do know from the math is that the change of one integer changes the results. And that brings us to, the, to, the, to today's passage in some weird way. Maybe I need to stop listening to audiobooks while I work because I get all these weird ideas. But when I think of the conversation that Jesus had with Pilate, this is what comes to mind. One of the things that I be, began to see more clearly as we read through Hebrews is the interconnectedness of our history and where and why Jesus had to do what he did. Our first parents were in Eden, which was the place where the realm of God and the realm of earth could meet. Adam and Eve walked with God and had full access to God, and God provided them with a job. And if we read the account there's something that we often miss. We assume that the garden was the entire earth, but that's not what it says. There were borders to the garden, which implies that there was something beyond those borders. And the job that God gave our first parents was to make the world beyond the borders, like what it was in the garden. They were to go into the world and be little agents of God's goodness. God spoke plants into existence, and Adam and Eve were to take those plants and spread them around the world. God created the animals, and our first parents were to run around the world playing hide-and-seek with those animals while they named them. They had a job to do, but there was a resistance. A serpent slithered around in the garden, and this serpent began, to spre began spreading deceptive words. This outside intelligence, which could also be called a shining one or a, a divine throne guardian, began to sow seeds of doubt within our first parents. Slowly, confusion entered, and once confusion began, chaos erupted. That's where we get the chaos of the chaos theory. One seemingly insignificant action changed the course of human history. God was, and God was determined to restore what was lost. One of his own spiritual beings began the problem, and only God could, could correct it. The incarnation is powerful because the God that set everything in motion around us stepped into human history. He stepped into human history in a seemingly insignificant manner. Not as a conquering titan like deity, but he came as a zygote. He entered this world just like each of us, the joining of genetic material inside a body of a woman. And he began, and he became a complete single-celled life form. And that single cell began to divide and evolve into an embryo. And the cells began to differentiate until it forms a fetus. And that fetus, after nine months, passed into life and takes its first breath. And once that breath is taken, the lives of the parents are forever changed because they no longer remember what sleep is. Jesus was born just like us. He grew within a family. 
He interacted with those around him. He attended school at the synagogue with all the other children. He worked alongside his family and and they built homes and potentially even worked on the temple. He became a man and he became and he was known as the carpenter within his neighborhood. The fact that the gospel says, isn't he the carpenter, makes me believe that Jesus was good at what he did. He had a good life, a good job, a great community. And then one day Jesus went to the river to see his cousin John and everything changed. Each of us has something that triggers our deepest self. For some of us, we have to create art. We must create art. We see a sunset and suddenly everything around us seems to stop until we can translate what we're seeing and feeling into a painting or a poem. For others, that deep-seated self is triggered by a perceived injustice around us. And when we hear a story of wrongdoing, we are driven to action. Others might have compassion for the sick. And when we hear a cough, we're compelled to comfort the suffering. We all have that aspect within us, that seed of joy that God has planted within us as we were woven together in our mother's womb. When we allow that seed to grow, we find who we truly are. Jesus had that too. He was happy as a carpenter, but there was something more to him, and he knew it. That seed, that spark of fulfilled life, took hold of him when John dipped him into that water, and suddenly human history snapped into to focus. And the reason Jesus was born was, became incredibly clear. And Jesus says, For this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. I want those words to fully saturate our minds, and and I want us to let them seep into our hearts. Jesus was standing before Pilate, facing execution, and this is what he said. He was standing in that place because the people within the surrounding community loudly proclaimed that Jesus was their king. This act had made the political leaders nervous. And he stood there because the religious leaders took advantage of that proclamation and and turned him over to their overlords. And they did this because so that they could maintain the power within community. They wanted to preserve a power that was progressively eroding from the moment Jesus lifted his head from the waters at his cousin's side. And Jesus stood there and he said, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. Jesus came into the world to stand before the powers constructed by men. He came to stand before these structures and to say, that their power is a mere shadow. Pilate asks Jesus if he is a king, and Jesus doesn't answer that question like we would expect him to. He simply says, Do you say this on your own accord, or did others say it about me, or say it to you about me? I find that answer kind of funny. I find it funny because by answering Pilate in this way, he's turning that question around and he's basically, he basically asked Pilate the same question that he asked Peter and the other disciples. Who do you say that I am? At that moment, Pilate is looking Jesus in the eyes. He is looking God into the eye and he must answer that very question. Who is Jesus? And Pilate doesn't know what to say. You can almost feel the uncertainty in the words that, as, as Pilate answers, Am I a Jew? 
your own nation and and priests delivered you over to me. What have you done? This answer is an evasion. Pilate doesn't know what to how doesn't want to answer the question. He may not even understand the question. He says, "Am I a Jew?" He has no framework to where to even to begin. Then Jesus answers the question for him. And he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. This is his purpose. He didn't come to rule the world in the manner that we think of rule. His reign is not like that of a king or a presidential term. His influence does not extend like the might that we see on the battlefield. If this is what God wanted to do, who could stop him? We are told in Scripture that God, to protect our own future, flooded the entire earth and saved one family. We are told that to prevent a coordinated destruction, he confused the languages and then he scattered the people across the earth so that they couldn't unify and and cause their own demise. We are told that in a moment of holy justice, God could wipe out an unrepentant city, totally wipe it off the face of the earth. Yet Jesus stands before Pilate and he says that this is not true power. And that is not my kingdom. True power is sacrifice. True power is standing for others, not yourself. True power is seeing that of God in your neighbor. That seed of joy or that spark of life and encouraging it to grow to its fullness. Jesus' purpose, the entire reason he was born, is to be the butterfly effect. One action performed by one man in a seemingly insignificant corner of the world by imperial standards that will change everything. With that one action, Jesus began to reverse the chaotic effects that were started by our first parents. And those waves move all around us. Waves of grace and waves of sin. When we believe in Christ, our lives begin to align with the waves of grace. And the more we turn to that frequency of life, the greater the intensity becomes and the waves begin to affect those around us. And grace spreads. We are also bombarded by waves of deception and sin. What will we reflect? What will we do? Jesus says in the Gospel of John, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. What is your effect? Will you live your life in the power of Christ's kingdom? Will you stand with Christ before the powers of the world, knowing that it might cost your life? Jesus came, was born, grew in stature and wisdom, became a teacher bearing the words of life. He stood firm even in the face of death and was executed and buried, and he rose again. He restores our hope and purpose. And each of us must answer the same question that Jesus turned on to Pilate. Will you listen to the words of truth or continue continue the deception? Pilate looked at Jesus and he said, What is truth? And we also have to answer that question. What is the effect that you will have? And how will you live your life today? Let us now enter into a time of of communion and open worship. And if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, then please share.
Otherwise, let us enjoy this communion with the Spirit. As I was sitting here, I got to thinking this meeting has been around for around 150 years or so. If you look around our meeting house, there's only one memorial plaque in the entire building. It's right over there by Sherry's seat. <laughs> A lot of people may not even recognize it. About a hundred years ago, Kansas Yearly Meeting decided during the middle of the worst time frame in agricultural history to send missionaries to Africa. Farms were going back to the bank and people were losing their, their livelihoods right and left, yet they decided that they needed to send missionaries to Africa. And that one little plaque is one of those people that decided to go. And from my understanding, he didn't really have much to do there because he was killed by a lion. But if you look at the plaque, it says he went to Congo or what would later become Burundi. And if we look around us, we see some of the butterfly effect taking place. That one person's life is seen all around us. Because if that one person didn't go, during the worst time of American agricultural history, half of this meeting house wouldn't even be here. One life can change the world, especially if that one life is serving God, not themselves, because that continues to grow. It continues to encourage for generations beyond what we can even see. Of all the memorials in this entire building, or of all the people that have come through here in the last 150 years, there's only one plaque. And we witness how important a single life can be. Before I do the benediction, I just want to make a little announcement. There are some apples out on the counter by the back door. For the children, if the older children will help the little ones to get one, that'd be great. Um, but for the benediction today, look upon your people who rejoice in your justice and mercy, and grant that the prayers we make may reveal Christ's reign in our time. Amen. Amen. Go in Go peace. peace. Yes, no problem. Thank